And you've got a <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sunday School Hour. I was just checking with my Facebook team. Uh, did you grab a lesson outline so you could get the title in there? No, you did not. They says they'll put it in later. Okay, very good. Uh, in the gray book, it's number 185, and the song is simply Jesus Loves Me. And you may go, why are you doing a children's song? Because it was never written to be a children's song. The person who wrote the song actually wrote it for adults. And sometimes as an adult, I'm afraid we grow up too much and then we stop serving the Lord as we should or loving Jesus as we should. So we're going to stand as we sing this song <clears throat> for our adult Sunday school hour, Jesus Loves Me. Let's sing it together. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. To ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, as he loved so long ago. Taking children on his knee, saying, let them come to me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He will stay close beside me on my way. He's prepared a home for me, and someday his face I'll see. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Amen. You may be seated. And uh, just to the ushers, keep monitoring the door. We'll leave the door unlocked until um, everybody we know is supposed to come in is here. And that is not everybody yet. And so anyway, just um, doing that. And let's have a word of prayer for those of you that are here. Glad that you're here. And uh, again, just letting you know, everything just kind of moves quickly in, in like clockwork. Uh, we have the adult Sunday school class. There's literally only about a two to three minute break. And then there's another class. And then as soon as that is done, uh, those of you who at that point aren't assigned from the next service uh, will generally need to exit out the side door this direction unless there's an ADA need. If there is, you can exit out the front door because we have other people that are coming in. And this is just kind of goes like this endlessly. So let's have a word of prayer. And um, let me say to the class here, is there anybody you do not have your Sunday school lesson plan that's here? Okay, that's just about everybody. Mark, could you do me a favor and pass those out? Because evidently, uh, for some reason, uh, that all got overlooked. And um, as Shannon, I'm just checking, is Haley still trying to get here? She's still trying to get here. Okay, just uh, double checking on that. So... Um, uh, basically, so here's what can happen, Lori. Mick can be in here until Haley arrives, and then he's banished to the outer darkness. So, oh, Mick, Mick drove away. He didn't like me. I thought he liked me. Okay, we're going to have a word of prayer, and uh, but good to have each and every one of you here, and thank you uh, for all your help. And uh, so Mark Backrow as well. Athena needs one as well. Um, Athena needs one as well. Um, we are moving out. I think I made enough right here. Okay, very good. 
And uh, for those on our Facebook uh, Live, watching on Facebook Live, um, um, uh, things are just kind of in motion. Oregon is now in phase one reopening, which means we have people in here. And so we're just kind of getting used to having people in here again. So let's have a word of prayer and uh, ask God's blessing on the lesson this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word in our hearts today because we need you more than anything else. Uh, we pray, Lord, for wisdom for our medical staff. We pray for wisdom for our governing officials because in looking at and in observing, we realize that both of them need lots of it and uh, maybe have a little bit of a shortage right now. So please help them, we pray. And uh, pray you would bless us in this lesson in Jesus' name. Amen. You are going to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're looking in chapter 3. Uh, this is lesson 5 in the series, the book of 1 Corinthians, the need for clarity in God's church. And lesson 5 asks a question, and this is an important question, and um, we're going to be dealing with this. But first of all, let me talk about what is going on here. If you look back at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, Paul initially addresses a problem. And he makes, he makes this statement in that he says, Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, I of Cephas, which you would know as Peter, and I of Christ. Hi, Haley. And um, so looking at this here, Paul starts out by addressing this contention issue. Now, there was a problem with, catch this, human hero worship in the church. And so the, what the huge problem is, by the way, this was creating divisions, this was creating factions in the church, and the problem, Paul's going to identify the problem in this lesson, and he says the problem is this, you're looking at the work of God in human terms. And this lesson addresses the issue by asking this question, are you carnal or are you a co-laborer? And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to look at the first 10 verses and we're going to answer these questions. First of all, you need to understand that this problem of carnality that Paul is going to address is seen in two ways. So let's look at these two ways as we go through here. Let's start at verse 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal, even unto babes in Christ. So we have an issue here. Anytime somebody calls you a baby, you know there's an issue. Like if uh, for some reason Lori said something to Jared and Jared didn't like it, and Jared got really pouty, then Lori would say to Jared, you big baby, okay? What it is, there's an issue with spiritual immaturity. And so here is what it is. First of all, we have to describe what the word carnal means. By the way, man, you'll love this word. The word carnal comes from the root word carne, which means flesh or meat, okay? Men, many of us here are carnivorous. In other words, I would much rather eat Bambi than bunny food. I would rather eat the bunny than the bunny food. I mean, that's just the way I am. You know, I'm carnivorous. I, I like burgers. You know, if you can fry it, I love to eat it. That's the way it is. But in the case of a spiritual condition, carnality is not good because what it means, it means to operate in a fleshly state. And what it means is you're being governed by your body, your flesh, your desires, and they're directing you. And you see, Paul would rather take this church, this church in Corinth, to the next level. But he can't. Because he's found that so much of the congregation, they're still technically in the church nursery. If you think about a baby, then you realize you're not going to be able to have an adult discussion. You're not going to be able to talk about a three-month-old about budgeting. You're not going to be able to have an adult conversation with the baby. The baby only thinks of the baser things. The baby thinks of 
being held. The baby thinks of being entertained. The baby thinks about eating, drinking, and then getting rid of what he had eaten and drunk. So Paul was hoping with the church of Corinth for more than a spiritual diaper change. So he's a little frustrated here. And so that's why he says this. He says, even unto babes in Christ. Look at verse 2. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. And so there's spiritual immaturity, and it's caused by spiritual infancy. In their spiritual condition, they're still babes in Christ. They have their salvation. They have little else. And so Paul cannot take them to the next step. By the way, this is not the first time that Paul has rebuked a group of Christian people for not growing in the faith as he should. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 11, he said, um, Of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, sing ye are dull of hearing. And then he says, Why? For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. And so we're dealing with this reality here. Paul similar rebuked this church for their seeming inability to get past the baby stuff and mature in Christ. So First of all, the carnality is seen in this way, spiritual immaturity, but then secondly, in unspiritual divisions in the church. And so look at verse 3 here. It says, for ye are yet carnal. You know what? That's not a good statement either. It'd be, I'm picking on Jared right now because Jared's right there and I can pick on him. Jared, this would be, what, this would be okay, you're supposed to take out the garbage, you know? And then... Lori will look over and see it's an hour later. The garbage is still there. And she will say, Jared, you still haven't taken out the garbage. And so what's literally he's saying to them, he said, I came back and you're still carnal. And so the, we have carnal symptoms here. Looking here, it says, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? So, there's two frustrations. One, you're still carnal. Why are you still carnal? That's number one. And two, that they're handling things no different than a lost person would. Literally, they're governed by unspiritual forces and attitudes. He says, you're walking like men. You know, you're supposed to be saved people, and you're living just like everybody who's never been saved. What's going on here is what he's saying. And then in verse 4, he identifies the evidence of it. He says this. He says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, and I another am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? And so what he's saying here, it's literally, there's the carnal evidence or the carnal symptoms are envying and arguing. And so the carnal source then is human hero worship. So, they had devoted, they had literally taken the ministry of Paul and the ministry of Apollos, and they had devolved it. They had digressed it. And so, they devolved it into, hey, they're celebrities. Hey, Paul's my hero. Really? Apollos is my hero. What's wrong with you? Apollos is so much better than Paul. Those are fighting words. Boo, 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 boo. And so, that's what was going on basically. It's like, you don't like my rock star? Well, I don't like your rock star either. Boo, boo, boo. You know, they come to blows and they're coming to fights and they're, they're arguing. And
significant and important to you because you had that hero. And so that's what was going on there. So, by the way, this is important to understand what happens when things descend into carnality and when in the Christian realm things become hero worship. Mark this down. Hero worship of man results in zero worship of God. And so it becomes a great distraction. It becomes a great distraction that prevents the spiritual attraction to the captain of our salvation. As the scripture says, uh, looking in Hebrews 2.10, it says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. doesn't matter who your hero is, it matters who your captain is, and your captain should be Jesus Christ. So first we deal with the problem of carnality, which was seen in two ways. Then we deal with the spiritual perspective of those who actually are the servants of God. So we're looking at verse 5 now, and here's what is said. Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave every man. It's important to understand... Paul and Apollos were God's ministering messengers. Now the Bible says in Romans 10, 14, and how shall they hear without a preacher? And that's talking about the gospel. How do you get the gospel to people? There has to be a preacher. So Apollos was a preacher. Paul was a preacher. So Paul and Apollos were simply preachers that God had sent to give the gospel. Now, when Paul says that the Lord gave to every man, he says, well, there's just me and Apollos and what God gave to every man. What he's trying to do is help the church see this is God's standard operating procedure. And what God does is he sends ministers to preach the gospel to everybody. It doesn't make them heroes. It's just these people have been sent. They've been deployed on a mission to get the gospel out to the world. And what he's saying is being sent a preacher. If you get sent a preacher, that doesn't make you more or less special than anyone else. It says what is special is what the preacher is preaching. The gospel of Jesus Christ is what is the special thing. So Paul and Apollos were God's ministering messengers, but here's the interesting thing. And they were involved in the planting, but this is important. It was God who gave the plant life, not Paul, not Apollos. It was God, and where it says this, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And so, neither, now catch this, because sometimes people go, I save somebody. Nobody saves anybody except for God. Neither Paul nor Apollos saved anybody nor did they have in themselves the gift of eternal life. I'm going to give you the gift of eternal life. No, all they could do is point him to God. God is the one who gives eternal life to the believer. Now, we have the privilege of being involved in that, but it is God who does the great thing. And we are excited about being involved in it, but it doesn't make us any more great or less great than somebody else. In fact, according to scripture in the ministry, there's only one person who deserves the credit, and that person is God. In verse 7, it says, So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither is he that watereth anything, you can put that in parentheses if you wanted to, but God that giveth the increase. So, Neither of these people are anything. God is the one who deserves the glorification. Let me tell you something. I planted seeds in the ground. I planted my radishes. I, I planted my peas. And my radishes are up. And my peas are coming out of the ground. So I'm going to tell everybody, I am the greatest farmer you have ever seen. I put a seed in the ground. And now I've got radishes. And I've got peas. Make me a plaque. Give me a trophy. No. 
because I didn't give the I didn't give the plant life. It's God who gave the plant life. I mean, I could put them in the ground; they could have rotted away, or nothing happened. But it's God who's the one who gives life, and it's important to understand that as we look. You know, it cannot be stated God is the only one who should get credit for anything good, anything noteworthy, anything eternal. As Jesus said to his disciples, "Without me, ye sh- ye can do." nothing. And so, what about the reward? Look at verse 8 here. It says, now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. I'll get to what that means in a moment. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So let's talk about this subject of working and getting a reward. Number one is this. It says, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. What does that mean? Those in God's ministry are on the same team. What that means is that I'm part of the team. I'm preaching. That doesn't make me any more important to say uh, um, um, Craig and Becky right now that are doing Facebook live streaming, okay? We're on the same team, okay? Carl helps Usher and Jim, they are deacons in the church. We're on the same team. So many of you um, do so many other things, except right now, going, I can't do anything. They've had the church closed. Okay, it's opening back up. But, but we're all on the same team. And so it's important to understand this. We all, um, you know, <clears throat> all those that are in God's ministry are on the same team. By the way, the best way for a team to work is called teamwork. That's the best way that a team works. We are all pulling the same way, we all have the same goal, and we all long for the same result. That is what being on the same team is. And this, but then it also says this, and looking here, individual labor will receive an individual reward. We're all on the same team. That doesn't mean we will all get the same reward, but to the degree that we work individually, to the degree that we work individually, we will be rewarded individually for the work that we do for the Lord. In other words, here's what it means. God will determine the MVPs, not us. God's the one who's going to determine that. So this brings us to the last two verses, and here's the thing, and I call this the same job site and the same building. Look at verse 9. I'm going to break it apart here. It says, For we are labors together with God. Now what this means is that, as we said, we labor together. If the work is going to get done, we all have to work together to get it done. And by the way, God has given us this ministry that is called reconciliation as between man and God. We have the responsibility to get the gospel out. That is something that all of us can do together. So we labor together. But then look at this. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. And literally what it says is what we build is each other. We are, in other words, it says we are God's husbandry. It means you're God's vineyard. You are God's building. And according to the scripture, what we build is each other. We are to cultivate each other like a vineyard, and we're to build up each other like a building. The term is called edification, and it's taken from the root word edifice or structure. We are to work together to everybody's good. That is what's part of being a team. Now look at verse 10 here. It says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. So two things here. One, Paul said, my job is to lay the foundation. Paul says, my job is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to establish churches according to the gospel of God that they understand the gospel, that I am a minister of the gospel, and I'm the preach that the basis from which everything must be built on is Christ. If you don't have Christ, you have nothing. If you have what you call church and you don't have Christ, all you have is a club. 
If you have a, what you call a church and you don't have the authority of the word of God and you don't have the basis of the gospel of Jesus Christ was that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and my sins to offer salvation as a gift and if you receive salvation, you can have that gift. You don't have to pay for it. You cannot work for it. God wants you to become a new creature. If you're able to get that word out, that's what a church is based on. You don't have that in a church. You have a club. You have a community center. You have a civic organization. You don't have a church. You have to have those things. So there has to be a foundation. The church is to be built on that tried and true and strong foundation. But after the foundation, each must carefully consider how they build. You see, in construction, your foundation determines the structure. Once you have your walls and your headers set up, you've got it. The dimensions of your building can't be the same. You can't then build the building and have it hanging two feet over the foundation. So the foundation determines how the building is built. It determines the outer dimensions. It determines the load limits. There is a plan to be followed, and you and I must consider how we build on that foundation. And you go, okay, how do we build on that foundation? I am so glad you asked, and I will give you the answer next week. So be sure to come back as we talk about this next week. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word in our hearts today and help us as we look to build up one another before you. In Jesus' name, amen. And the children's lesson will be coming very soon.